Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of praise, Hallelujah. Now we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and today we come to a very significant point in the Old Testament story, that being in the giving of the Ten Commandments. Now most people don't realize because they take their doctrine, their teaching, their understanding from the old movie, The Ten Commandments, but Moses was actually on the mount for 40 days and 40 nights. That's why the people grew weary of him and eventually ended up creating the golden calf because they thought that he had died up there. And we know this from Exodus chapter 24 and verse 18, which says, Moses went into the midst of the cloud, get him up into the mount, and Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. And the reason he was there so long is not just in order to receive the Ten Commandments, which would be the overall view of the commandments that the people were to follow, but there were another 700 commandments given him, which you can read in the book of Leviticus, as well as the instructions on how to build the tabernacle and all the ornaments and items that would be in the tabernacle. And it's important for us to understand that the Ten Commandments are like the ten headings. And under each of those headings are subheadings or subpoints that go into detail on how to be true and faithful to the main heading itself. And so in today's terminology, it would be like each of the ten commandments serve as main points, and under each one of those points are bullets. And so you can take the 700 plus commandments that are given throughout the Old Testament, specifically the law that God gave to Moses, and you can break them up into bullets and place them under each one of the Ten Commandments. And so as Moses has been called to the mount, it says in chapter 20, verse 1, God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou. Now, when he says thou, he's not talking to Moses specifically. Moses was a representative for all the people of God. And that's why when the people sinned, God always spoke personally and held it to the account of Moses by saying unto Moses, why have you done this? Well, it wasn't that Moses specifically did that. The people as a whole did it. But God is speaking to Moses as an individual on behalf of the people as a whole. And so he says, thou, he's saying, my people shall have no other gods before me. Now, as we have outlined, this is important because you must remember in the nation of Egypt, there were many gods. And as many of the Egyptians came out with the people of Israel, many of those false gods came out with them. And God understands that it's always going to be a temptation for the people to look to the other gods. And yet God is saying very specifically, you are to have no other gods before me. I alone deserve your worship. The second commandment is much like the first commandment because he says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, which the people were prone to do. They were to make images after the God whom they were serving. Yet we know the true and living God has no shape or form. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, as Jesus told us. And so it is a dishonor to God to try to create, place him in a shape or a form when he is so much larger than life, he is the almighty and he goes beyond any shape or image we would try to form him into. So he says, do not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. This includes angels. According to the word of God, if you have images of angels around your home, 
That is a direct violation to the scriptures because we are not to make any image in any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now, this, of course, would mean any animal or any creature of the earth. Now, let me back up and just say, keeping in context with what we have just read in the first commandment, this would seem to mean that we are not to pay homage to, we are not to worship, we're not to pray to any image because these are all creations of God. And of course, all of our worship is to be directed to the creator of all things, not the creature itself. And that's why he says in verse five, you will not bow down yourself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. And in verse six, I show mercy unto thousands of them that love me. We're in those thousands, friends, and praise God for it. And not only those who love me by the words that they speak, by the confession that they make, but those who keep my commandments, those who are obedient unto me. And if they love me, they would never dishonor me by using my name in a corrupt way, by misrepresenting me through the lives that they live. Therefore, in verse seven, thou art not to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, as much as it has been taught that this is simply saying God's name with a curse word following, that isn't necessarily what it means. What it's speaking of is that God is our creator. He's our father. He's our God. And we are representatives on earth of him and his kingdom. And when we misrepresent him through disobedient lives, through our flesh self-seeking ways, we are taking his name in vain because remember, vain simply means emptily. And if our lives are not full of his spirit and reflecting his person within us, his character and his nature, then our lives are empty or vain and we're bringing him no glory. We're bringing him no honor. In verse eight, as we mentioned in the last video, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You have six days to do the things that you want to do, even the things that you need to do to live upon the earth. And the things that you do in those six days are going to cost you much time that could be spent in other more rewarding places. Time, first of all, with God, not focused upon the details of your work or your job, but focused upon all the blessing that he offers and has bestowed upon you, but also time to spend on the meaningful things in life, such as your family. When you're working, you can't be at two places at one time, so you can't be at the park with your child. You can't be sitting on the couch with a loved one. You're occupied by the necessities of this life. But on the seventh day, I want you to pause from all those necessities and I want you to spend time and reflect on the things that are most important. Your relationship with me as your God and your relationship with the ones who I've placed in your life that you can be a reflection of me unto. And that is how we keep the Sabbath holy. Now, of course, like I said, there's bullets underneath that and so we're not supposed to work. We're not supposed to cause anyone else to work. But the ultimate reason is, is because everyone should be at a moment of pause and reflecting on the things that are most important. God and all the things that he is doing around us and for us are focuses upon him and then the ones whom he's placed into our lives. Now, as we move into verse 12 or the fifth commandment, notice that the first four are concerning our relationship with God. But the next six are gonna focus on our relationship with others. And what did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That would be the first four commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. That would be the last six commandments. Jesus said if you follow those two commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, you will fulfill all 10 commandments. Why? Because the first four commandments are in the first commandment that Jesus gave. The last six commandments are in the second commandment Jesus gave. And so Jesus said, yes, there's 10 headings, 
with bullets underneath, but I am now going to place two major headings above the 10 headings. And if you will focus all your attention on those two headings, you will take care of the other 10 headings and all the bullets that fall below them. And so in verse five, it says, honor your father and your mother, respect your father and your mother, listen to them, learn from them, glean wisdom from them, watch them, observe them, ask questions of them. For even if they're not dedicated followers of the Lord themselves, there is much that they have learned through the trials and the difficulties of this life, what we would call wisdom that they could pass on to you. And if you will only listen to them, heed their warnings, there are many things that they can teach you. Well, now in verse six, it says, thou shalt not kill. Now, if you were to look up that word kill in the Hebrew, you would find that it means with the intent of murder. It isn't speaking of war or battle. It isn't speaking of a law enforcement official when they are enforcing the law or even observing their duty under threat. It's speaking with a clear intent to murder someone. And most oftentimes, this would be an act of vengeance, of revenge. And we know that the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's not yours to take into your own hands. You're to be a people of forgiveness. Jesus said, love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. I had a conversation with someone earlier today, and I know that this is taught by many, even those that are in the church. But I challenge you to find it in the New Testament. You will find nowhere under any circumstances where the Bible allows us to defend ourselves, to picket, to strike, to take up arms against someone and fight. Not ISIS, not the government, not an intruder in our homes, and not the Antichrist and the forces that he brings when he brings persecution upon this earth against the Christian people. When Stephen was stoned, no one stepped up to defend him. When Jesus was hung on a cross, Peter tried, and Jesus said, don't do that, Peter. We don't act that way. He put the ear back on Malchus, healed him, and told Peter, look, if you're going to fight with the sword, you're going to die by the sword. But we are a people of peace. If I wanted to, I could have called 10,000 angels to defend me. But our love is shown in our surrender, in our compassion that goes beyond the state of the circumstances we're in. When we don't act like the rest of the world, but even under the highest form of threat, we remain calm and at peace because we know that God is in control of everything. Pilate said to Jesus, don't you know I have power to let you live or let you die? And Jesus said, you have no power unless the Father gives it unto you. And so when you think that you have a right to defend yourself, you must remember the words of Jesus. Nothing can happen to you or your family member unless God allows it. And so if you search the pages of the New Testament, you'll find that the people of God always laid down their lives freely. They suffered persecution with great honor. They walked into those prisons with their heads held high. They never lashed out or tried to defend themselves. Well, in chapter 14, we see the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, which means you shall not sleep with someone other than your wife, other than your husband. And remember, if you truly love your neighbor as yourself, which was Jesus' second commandment, you would never commit adultery against yourself, so therefore you wouldn't do it against your neighbor. You would never harm yourself, therefore you won't harm your neighbor. You will never steal from yourself, therefore you would not steal from your neighbor, which is the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. Now the ninth commandment is extremely important because this gets into the nitty gritty, so to speak, of the issues of the heart. It says, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not be deceptive, what some of us might call a white lie, because that deceptiveness reveals an issue of the heart. We know that Jesus is the light of the world. In him is no darkness at all. But when deceptiveness is present, there is darkness. 
And that's why if you look at the story in Acts chapter 5 of Ananias and Sapphira, the issue was the deceptiveness in their heart. They tried to deceive the very Spirit of God, thinking somehow that they could get by with it. And so in the ninth commandment, we are not to be deceptive against one another. We're not to make false claims against one another. And a bullet under this would be gossiping, speaking behind other people's back to cause them harm. We are not to do these things. And then finally, the 10th commandment is thou shalt not covet. Do not look upon the things of this world that other people have and desire them in your heart. And the reason for this is because you show a discontentment with what God has bestowed upon you. And you may think that it is less than others and what others have, but it's only because you're measuring what you have against what others have. But if you were to measure it by what God deserved to give you, rather than what he has blessed you with, you would count the simplest things in your life as great blessings, because all of us deserve punishment, pain and misery, and eternal destruction because we have all sinned before God. And again, if you'll look at the story in Acts chapter 5 of Ananias and Sapphira, and God dealt so harshly with them over one simple little white lie, that should cause us to be very grateful for the mercy and grace that God has shown unto us because if he had treated us like he treated Ananias and Sapphira, we would have been dead long ago. Well, in verse 20, we see why God has given these Ten Commandments. And mainly it's because when the people are let loose to run wild, to follow their own hearts, their own desires, with no boundaries around them, there's no end to what they will do. I mean, remember, in Leviticus chapter 18, it says, you're not to have sex with an animal. Well, God would have never gave that commandment had not it been a possibility for men to do such a wicked thing. And so God is reining men in and saying, no, I want you to stand within these boundaries. And I'm giving you these commandments because in verse 20, I want my fear to be before your faces. I want you to understand that there's consequences to your actions. And if you understand the consequences, then you will not sin. And the only way to know sin is to know what you are breaking. You must have a law. Without the law, there is no sin, as we are told in Romans. And so the law is here to give us a standard by which to live by. That's why Paul says so many times in his letter that God disapproves of a life of lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is simply a life with no restraint. And yet, as the people of God, we restrain ourselves, we forbid ourselves to follow the desires of our hearts, to follow the will of our flesh, because we know in our flesh there is no good thing. We are not a people of the flesh as the people of God. We are a people of the Spirit. And so we must learn to listen to His Spirit, to recognize the voice of His Spirit, which will never contradict his holy word, but we also must understand and learn the difference between the voice of the spirit and the voice of the flesh. Because just as constant as the spirit speaks to us, so does the flesh. And the flesh is always going to be opposed to the things of God, the ways of God, the commandments, the statutes, and the laws of God. The flesh says, if it feels good, do it. But the spirit says, crucify your flesh daily. Take up your cross. Endure the hardship, the suffering, and the pain that encompasses the life of one of my followers. For if they mistreated me, your Lord, what makes you think you would be any better? What makes you think they would treat you any differently? And so I want you to look unto my example, says the Lord Jesus. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and that's what I expect of you as my followers. And you do this by surrendering and becoming servants under the law of God. 
following his way at all time, no matter what it costs you. And if you do this, there will be a day you'll stand before me and you'll hear the words, good and faithful servant. And so let us end today reminding ourselves of what Jesus said and pondering on these words throughout the remainder of this day. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Consider that. With all your mind. Consider that. With all your strength. Consider that. With all your soul. Consider that. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Friends, in those two commandments lie the greatest secrets of service unto our Lord and the most simple and obvious ways that we can represent him on this earth. Well, I pray that your journey will be blessed today. I pray that your eyes will be enlightened to truth. I pray that your mind will be open to the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that your heart will be exalted to the heavens in praise, worship, glory, and honor unto our great King, Jesus of Nazareth. Hallelujah, friends. I love you. I pray for you daily. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I'll see you on the next video.